Hello, my name is Kubik, uh, and I'm holding the seminar about machine language, using machine language monitors, a lost art. So um, for a start, I had put this presentation on, but uh, I will switch to the computer where it's all about a big changing. So uh, one of uh, the things that we think that, oh, sorry. What? <laughs> OK. Just. Uh, this should work, and I would like to introduce this seminar with the following message in English. It means it seems that perfection is not found if you can't add anymore, but it is found when you can't cut any menu, anything more, anymore. And this is from Antoine Cézanne à Soupery in the book Charles Arms Free L'Avion on page 16. And uh, that's one of the things that, in my opinion, is the essence of the demo scene. And why, why, did, I, why, why did I include that message? I think uh, uh, we want to see what can be found out with the simple, with the least minimum effort to make the maximum. And um, that was the reason I chose this topic, because it's an, about a programming tool that aims to bring the most for the least effort. And uh, as with all programming tools, we you know the first thing you want to do with is build a hello world. And um, especially in the type of language we are cho I'm choosing here, I'm using here, um, doing a hello world would take me at least two or three minutes, or as long as I'm talking about that here. <laughs> but just typing in, that would take too much time. And uh, I would just uh, use a little bit of incantation. Uh, sorry. Yes, that's all. No. <laughs> it was supposed to work. Well, let's see um, if uh, at least the monitor is there. There we go. So, this is just assembled the hello world from the file on disk. And we started with this command. And there we have hello world. So, successfully built with the minimum effort that you could imagine just a few instructions. And they call the operating system and then you get the hello world without any basic, without any other language, just machine language. So this is about using machine language man monitors uh, and whether it's a lost art. So uh, the topics I will cover in this seminar 
uh, what is a machine language monitor. I will say a little bit of, about the theory of operation. That means what is relevant about the resource use and what is the environment uh, that a monitor pro provides for running programs. I give a little bit info about the historical background, um, how the hardware I'm using here came to be, and also first the software, then the hardware. I will give a little bit uh, info on the features, and uh, I had also uh, envisioned to show quite some use cases, but uh, in the interest uh, of the demo party, I will probably cut one or two of the examples. At last, uh, I will uh, give a comparison with other tools that serve in the same league, but with uh, more, more effort required, and come to a conclusion. So, uh, okay. So, what is a machine language monitor? So, uh, to answer this question, we actually need to know what is machine language itself. So, machine language, that are the instructions that run on the CPU itself. So, we have... It's okay. So, uh, machine language, the, those are instructions that run on the CPU of a computer itself, on the central processing unit, and that's actually the only language a computer understands. So we have high-level languages like C, Java, BASIC. <laughs> Even BASIC is a high-level language in comparison to machine language. But after all, there are all, all, only instructions in machine language that run on the CPU. And you can program a computer just in machine language. Um, when you are going there, Murphy's Law fully applies. Everything can go wrong. Machine language doesn't observe any of the niceties that you know when you are working in high-level languages. Do one thing wrong and your computer crashes. And a little bit uh, to say about that, uh, monitors were the first, first um, languages that existed, so you could at least program the computer in machine language and had some control about how the code was executed. And uh, the only thing you can probably think about is, is a monitor part of the operating system kernel, or is it actually a language implementation uh, that varies. Uh, for example, with the Apple II, uh, the first thing that starts up is the monitor, and then you have to start ba basic as, as language. Uh, on other computers, uh, like the later CBM 8-bit uh, home computers, uh, monitor was um, just another language uh, that could be called by a basic command monitor, and then was at your service. Or you could be one of the unlucky ones, and there was no monitor there at all. And that was the case, actually, with the VIC-20, the predecessor of the Commodore 64. You just had the bare machine with the kernel, with basic, with a little bit of RAM, but no monitor. So, uh, I will probably call it a little bit short. That's uh, about the resource use, resource use uh, because uh, any program uh, needs resources, the CPU, memory, I.O., and um, typical for monitors is they are designed to run alongside other programs, and so there's always possible that uh, you have a resource clash. With this with the 6502 CPU, the most important resource clash happens with the zero page, and uh, you, but you need some zero page because some of 
the address modes of the CPU are, uh, they require the use of the zero page. And with the VIC-20 in particular, you have a limited memory map, uh, a limited RAM and a larger fixed memory map, and that's the reason I gave out the sheet that is our mental map for the examples I go into. Without uh, such a map, you easily get lost in the addresses that might appear on screen. And uh, the final question is, uh, is uh, where, when we include a monitor in the system, where should its code be placed? Where should its workspace be placed? Because also a monitor needs some, some workspace variables where it keeps some info like the input line or some info like when he translates instructions given in the input line into machine code. Uh, he just needs a little bit of memory to work with. And the pointers, that means really pointers into the address space of the CPU, they would need to go into the zero page. There is also an aspect about the permanence of workspace variables, uh, but uh, that it's not, I will cut that short. So um, the monitor itself uh, provides an environment for the code. And uh, for the 6502 CPU, it's particularly simple because the CPU has so few registers. We have just the accumulator, which absolutely handles 99% of, um, of all data, data that runs through the CPU. Without the accumulator, you wouldn't be able to do anything. And then you have two registers as index registers, a processor status register, a program counter, and a stack pointer. And all of them are 8-bit only, except the program counter, which is 16-bit. And the least thing a monitor must be do is save and restore that context when it's entered from the code and when it re-enters the code that it monitors. And um, for this, uh, most uh, the, the, the vendor of the CPU uh, gave the break instruction. That's uh, one, one possible defined monitor entry. We can also use interrupts or even use a virtual machine. It is possible to virtualize a 6502 in itself, but it's really difficult and uh, it's for, for such a small tool, it's normally out of, out of the question. And um, that being said, uh, those monitors have an interesting historical background. And uh, an evidence of this, uh, of this is the so-called ENSTDS subroutine that, come, that, is, that, that had already been written by Steve Jobs uh, no, Steve Wozniak, sorry. That, uh, that, is, that one is from oh, uh, Steve Wozniak and, and Alan Baum. I need to correct this. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really compressed, compressed knowledge about the, the machine code instructions we put into that routine. It's heavily table-based and also contains hash functions and uh, and that routine is so efficient that it found its way in lots of other monitors, like, and, and Commodore was no exception, they just copied that routine in all their monitors. Uh, in 1976, uh, we had then uh, uh, the first, first implementations uh, uh, of a terminal interface monitor where I've been told uh, just today that it was possible to uh, port it for the Kim one but it was not the original operating system. There, was some there is some for necessary. Um, and uh, with 1977 and the following years, there we got the Super Supermon extension, and that is actually uh, more or less uh, the ancestor of Minimon. 
We had also on the WIC-20 actually uh, two cartridges, WIC-1 and his one, but they came with their own share of problems because uh, they were ported uh, in a way that didn't suit the computer. We had also uh, another, uh, the continuation was on the C64, the AMDS uh, programmer support, and Tedmon on the, on the plus four, on the C60 and C160, and uh, all they share that lineage. Uh, there were some independent developments, notably Asmon from the German magazine 64er, uh, that used completely different routines, but uh, you find uh, that common lineage uh, nearly everywhere else. So, well, how did I come to do to produce a uh, Minimon? Um, the WIC-20 was my first computer, and then I had a Commodore 116, and uh, Tedmon was actually the first monitor I could use. I didn't have one with the WIC-20, but uh, Tedmon was, was my first experience with a monitor, and I took it as blueprint because it nearly uh, brought exactly the, the instructions or the commands that I wanted. I disassembled it in itself. Uh, I made uh, the necessary steps to make a relocatable re re source for it, and then uh, also adaptions to screen size uh, and workspace variables that ne needed to be done. And at that point, I thought I was cut and dried with that. And then I looked into the code and thought, what a mess. Actually, uh, the original Tetmon in the ROM had a wrong branch range check. The branches in the 6502 have a limited range, and it was simply wrong by two bytes. And also, if the user, um, if the user added uh, uh, repeated, repeatedly um, um, entered uh, wrong, uh, wrong commands, then a stack overflow could occur after roughly 60 inputs, and they didn't test for that. I eliminated those bugs, and uh, only when I was finished with that, I added some careful extensions and two commands. So, and uh, I thought about uh, that is part of the resource use, what I mentioned earlier, that, it, uh, that uh, the code of the monitor should be put away from any other place where it could um, serve problems. And if you look at that map here you have, you see that um, uh, the normal, normal scenario would be with a greater than 8K RAM expansion, that is the rightmost column, and you see everything is filled with either RAM or ROM or I.O. And uh, there's actually only one sensible place to put the monitor in, and that's in the I.O. resources. And normally, that is reserved for cartridges. And, um, and that's a sensible place to put the monitor there, because no program can expect to find RAM or ROM there just I.O. And the I.O. normally is uh, reserved for cartridges, for the cartridge firmware, and no other program has to mess around with that. So, um, I, um, the, the hardware itself got to a prototype, and uh, that was, ah, I should, Better, sorry. That was it. Uh, okay. So that was the prototype, or is the prototype? It's just a standard 3K expansion unit, 
So three extra kilobytes for the big 20 added with an app ROM and a little bit of chip select logic. And um, when I was uh, finished with the hardware design, we, I arrived at that. So that's uh, some bit of little bit extra logic added. Uh, and most important, a cartridge extender, so I can put in another cartridge and uh, it runs under control of the hardware that the monitor provides. It is possible to make a backup copy of any cartridge that exists, even itself. Um, so, let's continue the presentation. Uh, the most important part of this is that it is able to disable the auto start feature of any cartridge. Uh, normally, uh, many cartridges would be able to uh, divert control to themselves, and uh, there is a, a hardware feature built in that prevents that auto start on the user's uh, on the user's choice. Okay, so we are here. Continue. Ah. So um, this is uh, the feature set, and that's practically any, everything you would uh, expect from a simple monitor. Uh, and the direct assembler and disassembler is in there, and it's only two kilobytes in size. And most direct competitors are at least twice the size. And what you have also seen quite at the beginning is the support of kernel I.O. Uh, redirection. Uh, I piped an input file into the monitor and made the batch assembly. And uh, uh, the other way, uh, uh, redirecting the output is quite normal for most things, like switching the output to a printer or switching the output to a file. And what can we do with this? So um, uh, ha um, having such a monitor available opens up quite a lot of options that are not possible by using BASIC alone, uh, at least not in, in a simple way, and uh, I will now switch to the VIC-20 once again. Let's see. And um, I'll load a small program. And what I want to do is a fancy remark. So the screen editor used by BASIC that does not allow for some fancy, fancy changes of the program text. We'll do something about this. This is some of the applications of monitors that's of often overlooked. Uh, there are lots of, lots of uh, uh, utilities and tools that aim to make special changes to basic programs, and one of them is uh, producing fancy remarks. When I, for example, try something like this, oh, so this is uh, trying to do this in inverse, it just doesn't work. You simply get that. The same thing happens if you try to change the color and write this.
that's not permanent, if I try to lift this, still blue, not red. And uh, we need to incorporate the control character uh, at the position where the star is. And the simplest way to do this is using a monitor. And uh, um, we have started with an unexpanded VIC-20. And if you look at the left column, you see that the basic memory starts at 1000 hex. And that is uh, something we just take a look at. You see there is a hex dump of the memory. And what you see is the tokenized code of the basic program. And um, the star that I entered has the Petsky or ASCII code 42, and that's 2A in hex. We just go and change that uh, to another one. And uh, for that particular reason, I will uh, just take a reverse code. Um, and the reverse code is uh, part is is available in the, uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in the book, in the instructions. I uh, just changed that byte. And I go back and get this. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually, uh, actually one of the simplest things. You can't do that with the basic editor, but you use a monitor, and there it works. So let's see. OK, so. OK, and uh, the, the, other, the other thing here is training games that, uh, let's see what the time is. Yeah. OK, so actually. Uh, Oh no. Okay. Um, I just take a look. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, six use cases I had prepared, uh, I will only show you this one, because uh, that was also uh, being uh, mentioned as, as, as first, uh, and as main, main uh, besides making copies, uh, main use of monitors, uh, I will train a game, and I will show you uh, how, I, how I proceed with that. And uh, let's see. Take. So um, for this, I need to uh, add a memory expansion because the game actually wants a full memory. That means another 35 kilobytes. And I'm using this uh, cartridge for this, a mega card, which had been uh, developed in a community afford by the Deny Forum. Just uh, switch off. And instead of the normal startup message, uh, there now comes a menu, and possibly also some use. Oh, uh, no. Yes, uh, just another one. OK, so and uh, I'll just use it to add the necessary memory. And the game I will train is Get More Diamonds by, uh, and uh, this is a particularly hard game. You get three lives at the beginning, and uh, Ah, 
I need to see the directory. Okay, there we go. This takes a little bit of time because I'm not using a fast loader here. So I, I will use the, uh, the time to explain. Uh, normally, uh, such game enhancing tools on other platforms uh, use a particular technique uh, to uh, find the positions where the number of life is stored. Uh, you start the game, freeze it, uh, enter the number of games uh, of lives you uh, have at the moment, uh, and then all those addresses are stored uh, when they are found in the memory. And um, then you lose one life, uh, and you enter the number of lives you have now, and uh, then uh, all those uh, that uh, don't follow the pattern are excluded, all those addresses that follow the pattern are excluded. And then you lose another li life, and then you are narrowing down the range of addresses that contain, contain the number of lives. And uh, with limited RAM and even 35 kilobytes, it doesn't suffice because everything is now occupied by the game. Uh, you just have no memory to start that list away. And uh, so we need another uh, method uh, to take a look, and that is really looking where is the number of lives fetched from, how it is displayed, how it is, how it is decremented and compared with zero, so the game ends. I start the monitor and it crashes. No. It is, the game is still in memory. I will use a freeze reset. So I get into the simulation. Uh, in, so I don't need to reload the game. Oh no. Um, sorry. I'm afraid we have to reload again, so I, I use the, use, will use the time to explain further. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, at least uh, uh, one thing to note about this, you can't break anything. <laughs> so. This is the command to change in a disk image. And the game is uh, stored on, on a disk image. And this is the command to load the first file on disk. And, uh, well, okay, it's, uh, it's like uh, when I first, when I first uh, uh, wanted to find out uh, how uh, I could train this game, uh, I actually was a little bit puzzled because uh, it didn't uh, directly reveal uh, and also because the code is so big, uh, it doesn't uh, actually uh, need the 35K right on the beginning, but rather uh, uh, it expands on the rest of uh, uh, unavailable memory. Uh, but um, the, um, the code uh, we need to search for is uh, already there, just needs to be loaded. So now let's see. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm now loading a transient program that is necessary to make a quick overview over the, over the available memory. And uh, not really. Yeah, yeah. 
Das Problem ist halt eben, äh, ja, okay. I'm now loading the program. I was uh, simply in the wrong directory. And here we have a tool that gives us a page-wise view of memory. And uh, what we want to look at is already in the first page. And what you see here, um, we, uh, we otherwise would need to start the game. What you see here is the score display. And the number of lives um, seems to be stored here at the place. You start with three lives. And uh, what we actually need to find out where, where the instruction is that stores the currently number of lives at that position. That means we need to check for a store in instruction that puts its data at, yeah, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, okay. Um, that was the first, the first idea I had, but that didn't, didn't work out because actually that's not the, really, the real display, but the blueprint. And what we need to find is uh, the instruction that copies that string into, into screen memory. And uh, that instruction uh, is this one, supposedly this one. Uh, where it is loaded from for So, and uh, we see, uh, normally we would get the hex bytes from the instruction, and um, this, is the, this is the assembled instruction, and we hunt for this in memory. And if we are lucky, we just get one hit. There it is. So um, we now would uh, see that same instruction somewhere in memory, uh, but it's uh, sensible to go a little bit to earlier addresses and then see where it gets its data from. Oh, wh wh where the instruct where where everything is stored to. And uh, that's ah, there we go. You see here. That's the loop that writes to the first, uh, the, f the first uh, line of screen memory. So actually, that what we have seen ends up in screen memory. And we just take a look at it again. And that would be address 1008. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now we hunt for any store instruction that goes to that address. And that would be that instruction. Possibly there are also other candidates. And um, I now take a look where this instruction sequence is being executed. And there is the hit, one single instruction. And again, uh, we would like to assemble a little bit earlier so we see where it gets its data from. And uh, let's see. 
XA a little bit more. And here we have the star to that address and it gets its data from 3F in a zero page. And it's that exact address where the number of life is restored. And the next thing we now would do is to search for a decrement of 3F. I do a test assembly once again in the same fashion and see how that is supposed to look like. And you see C6, 3F, and the zero one, uh, one zero is from, from uh, the former instruction. And then now I will finally hunt for this one. And there is the single hit. We have found the instruction that decrements the number of lives. I just uh, also make an disassembly uh, some addresses before that. You see here, there is just a jump, and then she makes a superfluous LDA 3F for whatever reason. As long as it's positive, that's okay. But, it's, but uh, uh, if it's actually zero, well, not, not really. If it goes below zero, so that means actually it's the number of lives left. And if that is uh, underflowed, then the game gives you game over. So that is uh, a method that is, uh, of course, a little bit more complicated than uh, having a freezer searching that address for you and uh, eliminating or filling up the number of lives with 255. But that is, uh, uh, that is a method that works in any case. So uh, in the interest of time, I will just come to the conclusion of uh, the seminar. There are other examples. Uh, uh, the VIC-20 will be uh, uh, on one, you will see that it's near the middle, middle line on the sixth row, uh, counted from, from the beam line, from, from, uh, from the for, uh, uh, so, and uh, you, you, will see, you will see the VIC-20 in action, and if you have any further questions about uh, how that monitor can be used, just ask them there, but I would like to come to, to, to the conclusion now. So, there is, uh, uh, you can do the backup copies, you can uh, watch interrupt processes with it, you can relocate code, and you can also do the batch assembly, what uh, I've also, what I've already shown you uh, at the beginning of the seminar lecture. And uh, uh, as a final comparison with other tools, you can't do a freezer cartridge with the VIC-20. It's just not possible. The main board logic doesn't allow for that. Uh, for the VIC-20, uh, Minimon actually is the first tool that uh, works seamlessly with the kernel and with basic and doesn't disturb the operation. That's something that VIC-MON, the official product of Commodore, just got wrong. And uh, any further improvements they will require you to do changes on the main board, and uh, for many people that's a no-go. Uh, and of course, uh, WISE uh, is a real option here with the built-in monitor, but you don't have always WISE available <laughs> because uh, we are on a demo party. I think native monitors have still a legitimation of existence, especially on demo parties. And remember, in foreign code, you have no symbols. Thank you for attention. I would like to add a big thanks to the Vice team. Without Vice, my rediscovery of the Big 20 
and uh, the construction of Minimon wouldn't have been possible. So enjoy the party, have fun, and uh, see you maybe on the place. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so thank you. Um, I would like uh, uh, to remind you there is an excellent uh, lecture being scheduled on 10 a.m. tomorrow from Esfu Ali, which, uh, uh, which is an excellent uh, extension and uh, also uh, takes uh, the things from another viewpoint about uh, how home computers became home computers. <laughs>